And a great pleasure now to uh, welcome to our Book Talk segment. A woman has written really a fascinating crime book, something she experienced with a great title. It's called The Spider and the Fly, a reporter, a serial killer, and the meaning of murder. We're joined today by Claudia Rowe, who uh, writes for the Seattle Times and uh, many different uh, other outlets as well, including the New York Times. And she joined us by telephone. Claudia, good to talk with you. How are you today? Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have a chance to talk with you for a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, obviously, somebody who's written about crime, uh, you, you've seen a lot of things that uh, the rest of us, uh, I guess, fortunately have not had to experience. But this is, I guess, uh, one of the more unusual or, I guess, one of the highlights of uh, your crime reporting career, isn't it, about this case? Yeah, I've I've done some crime reporting, but I am actually an education reporter, and I have to say that this was quite a different kind of education. Yeah, this took place uh, back in 1998. You were working at that time uh, uh, for the New York Times, right? The uh, upstate New York, Poughkeepsie area, a little bit north where I grew up. Yeah, I was a stringer for the New York Times. At, the, the, these crimes took place between 1996 and 1998, and at that, that point I was uh, stringing for the New York Times, yes. What got you on that case at that point? Did the editor just say, go cover this, or, or, or what happened? What happened was women were missing um, from Main Street in downtown Poughkeepsie, but no one was writing about it much, very little. And friends of mine who still worked at the local paper, where I had been a reporter, said, Claudia, you got to get on this. You got to talk to the New York Times about this. This is a big deal, and nobody's really looking at it. So I called them, you know, and said, I don't really know if this is a story or not. I don't really know what's going on, but there is this strange pattern here. And they said, well, yeah, make some phone calls. Get on it. So I did, and within a week, Kendall Francois confessed. Yeah, was Kendall Francois was his name, and uh, so often seems to be the case. Uh, seem, I guess, to the people around him, right? Very calm, uh, kind of a quiet person. But uh, those are the people that usually, you know, when they go this way, those are the type of personalities that do this, right? <laughs> well, I don't know if I could say those are the make a huge generalization about those are the types of personalities. Not always, but I, it seems like that that happens quite a bit. Well, certainly, there's a lot of repressed anger. I think we can say that. Right. People who are, are prone to do this might have a lot of repressed anger. Certainly, Kendall Francois did have a lot of repressed anger. So he did come across to the wider world as this very affable, often passive, extremely polite, uh, gentle giant, as people called him. When you first, uh, or how, how did you first uh, you know, talk to him or, or get, get into a position where you could actually uh, talk to him? You, you interviewed him several times, right? Uh, yeah, many times. I wrote to him initially when he was in the county jail awaiting dispensation of his case. That was in 1999. And we began corresponding, and then about six months into that correspondence was the first phone call. Then we had sort of fairly regular phone calls for a while, and then approximately a year after I had first written to him, approximately, was our first in-person meeting at the jail, and then I visited him a couple of times at Attica State Prison. So he wrote to you pretty soon after you wrote to him? I mean, it was pretty uh, pr pretty close to the time? I mean, it wasn't a long waiting period before he wrote back to you then? Uh, there was a bit of a waiting period. You know, he I, I had imagined in my vanity and naivete that he would respond right away, but he <laughs> did not respond right away. He was a, a pretty deliberative person and very... Um, sensitive to the idea of being used, though, of course, he was, in the, in the end, used by, by me. Um, so I wrote to him a second time, and he did respond after that. And then the first, uh, was the first time you, you talked to him on the phone, or was it in person talking to him? Can you repeat that question? Was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was the first time you, you talked to him on the f telephone, or was the first time you talked to him in person? The first time I spoke to him was on the phone, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, and at that point, you asked, can we meet? And then you met at, at, at Attica, which, uh, for those of you, people around the country, no, you know, or if you grew up in New York, you've heard of it. Sorry. It's not a pleasant place to be, even if you're a visitor. <laughs> right. Attica is not a pleasant place to be. But, you know, I had asked him for an in-person meeting many, many, many times before he agreed. So we talked on the phone, but he still wouldn't put me on his visitors list at the jail, not for a while. And again, you go into the book in, in great detail of, of how those meetings uh, went, your conversations 
with him. Uh, as a reporter, you're kind of trained, I guess, not you know to put whatever nervousness or trepidation you have aside. But uh, that first visit, uh, uh, how did you feel? More excited than nervous, or nervous than excited, or what was your thoughts at that point? I was terrified all the time. I was terrified <laughs> even reading his letters. I was terrified on the phone, and I was terrified visiting him in person. Though I will say that once we were speaking either on the phone or in person, that fear would sort of ebb away in the face of a kind of relentless hunger for knowledge. And I would begin to, to challenge him and he, you know, and, and ask him questions that he found too pushy. So I, I clearly lost my fear of, of bothering him, um, obviously, at a certain point. But in the lead-up to those visits and in the lead-up to the phone calls and in even opening the letters, I was always frightened. Did you have a, I guess there was a guard in there with you, right, just to, for safe, to be for safe, or were you totally alone with him in, in, the, in the jail? Well, in the first visit at the county jail, we were in a little, in a little room with a plexiglass barrier between us, right. so he's locked into his side and I'm on my side. So there was no guard there, but he's locked on his side of the glass. In the visits at Attica, it wasn't like that at all. There was no barrier between us, and he was not shackled, and we were sitting literally, you know, almost thigh to thigh, really close at this small card table. There were guards in the visitor's room, but they were rather far away. Did you feel at all, even though you're, you, know, you had somebody around to hopefully protect you, did you ever feel totally unsafe? Or at that point when you're doing the interview, you just kind of put that aside and just keep going, I guess, right? He put it aside and just keep going. I didn't feel, once I was actually there doing it with him, all of that fear, as I said, kind of ebbed away. And in, in truth, in being rational, Kendall Francois is never going to, like, reach out and grab me in public. Right. That was not how he operated at all. But I, I didn't have the presence of mind at that moment to think so rationally. Yeah. And, again, we want the, uh, our listeners to, uh, to get the book and get the details on it. But uh, just the, the thought of uh, talking to somebody like that, it's fascinating in one sense. But uh, I guess it's uh, in another sense, you know, you say, how can uh, – uh, people get to that point where they do these types of things. I guess it's it's a, kind of a mixed uh, mixed uh, feeling there you have, right? I was really fascinated by what is the evolution to get to this point, definitely. Yeah. And sometimes that fascination would overpower my fear. The Spider and the Fly is the name of the book, A Reporter, A Serial Killer, and the Meaning of Murder. And we've been talking with uh, Claudia Rowe. We just have limited time today, so we want to give uh, our listeners a, a taste of what the book's about. But give out your website, Claudia, if you have that, and people can get more information about sure, it. Sure. Yeah, ClaudiaRowejournalist.com. People can uh, see a little more from the book there. You can order it anywhere. It should be at your local bookstore or online. Easy to get. And it's R-O-W-E, the, the last name. And, Claudia, appreciate you taking uh, a few minutes to uh, talk to us uh, on, your, on your book tour. Hopefully we can do it again, but uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together... We can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.